My name is Jerry Wishelms, and I love teaching at JCC. Tonight, we are going to basically start a process. We don't know how long it's going to go. Tonight, we've got two hours. Um, but it will move from something very important. That is a definition of what we're talking about. Um, the Basically, tonight, we're calling it a conversation about words. And the word is racism. And what does it mean? It doesn't mean that we have to come to one definition. I don't think that would be realistic. But we need to come to an understanding that it's more than what we think it is. And uh, the process tonight is going to try to unveil and allow us to examine that within ourselves and in our, in our society. The forum itself, I'm going to take less than five minutes now, and then we'll go with the forum and the, uh, the people that are going to be talking. We will have each person who is presenting to you six minutes. I'll try to hold them to that time. Uh, that way we can get through the evening with a reasonable amount of sanity. Uh, each one will have six minutes of uninterrupted time to make a presentation. The first presenter is going to be uh, Dr. Brian Toppin. And so I'll let Brian introduce himself and he will take his subject and run with it. Okay, Brian. Thank you very much, Jerome. Um, little thing, I'm not a doctor, eventually someday, but it's just uh, Brian Topping. I'm an assistant professor of English at JCC. Um, I've been teaching for 11 years, and for probably uh, about nine out of those 11 years, um, I've used discussions of race and social justice um, in my English composition and research courses, because um, it is vitally important. It's always been really important. And even more so today with so much uh, media coverage of the terrible violence we see going on, um, that we're really even more aware of how far we still have to go. Um, so today I just want to talk a little bit about um, the power of the words that we use, uh, specifically the word racist, um, but the difference between um, racist as a noun, um, as, 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 a, as a type of person, um, someone being a racist, uh, as opposed to someone that just does, says, or thinks something that is racist, um, has a racist idea, um, where it's really an adjective. And it's a really important distinction between the two. Because um, when we think about the word racist, we immediately, we immediately imagine this individual person who has all these horrible, immoral, or evil things inside of them. Um, when we think of a racist, we think of um, some horrible person that always says, or always does, or always thinks racist things. Um, we think about, um, throughout our history, we think about slave masters, we think about um, the KKK, um, other white, white power groups, or just people that take it upon themselves to lynch or murder black people throughout history. Um, but when someone thinks, says, or does something racist, um, it means that those actions, those thoughts, those ideas, um, those are the racist key parts. It's not necessarily the person. Um, it doesn't automatically make them bad people. Um, racist is a descriptive term. So someone could actually do a lot of really good positive things in their life. Um, there could be, um, you know, a white man that spends his entire fortune building up minority communities because he sees the importance in there. Um, it could be people that give money to the poor and to the needy um, of all creed and color and cultures. Um, and these really good people can still have moments of racism. Um, so you can be a good person, um, actually not just believe you're a good person, but be a good person and still have moments of racism. Um, it's very, very common. Um, for example, um, a lot of the common phrases that people think of or they use um, when talking about racism, things like uh, if, if someone just said, it's not safe to go into black neighborhoods. Right? Just that statement itself, um, it doesn't sound negative, but it is because what that statement is doing is it's linking violence to black neighborhoods and equating all black neighborhoods to being violent ones. Um, it's such a generalized stereotype that it is a racist thought. It is a racist phrase. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, other ones like um, African Americans are lazy. If you say that, you're putting this label on an entire population. It's a racist idea. Um, but some people, when they say things like this, or they think things like this, or they act upon these ideas, 
uh, they might genuinely believe that what they say is true um, based on a variety of factors. It could be personal experiences with a very small per percentage of the population. Um, it could be media influences, whether it be TV, movies, or news. Um, it could be something they were taught by their family growing up. It could be something they learned um, with the friends they gained as they grew older. But because this is something that they firmly believe to be true, they're never going to analyze these ideas. And then they'll never even recognize that that phrase is a racist viewpoint. <clears throat> and the big reason for that is because any time that someone is either actually attacked, uh, physically or verbally, or they just feel like they're being attacked, um, your automatic response is to defend yourself, right? Whether it be physically or verbally, right? You wanna defend yourself. It's that fight or flight kind of sense. Um, so if anyone is called a racist, the first reaction from that person isn't, hmm, let me stop and think about this. It's gonna be anger, it's gonna be denial. Um, the last thing they're gonna do is internally analyze that thought, right? They're not gonna think about what they just did or what they said. So instead, they try to qualify the position, that defensive posturing. They say, well, you know, I have a lot of black friends or I'm the least racist person I know. Uh, my college roommate was black. Um, or, or they'll kind of backstep a little bit and say, well, I'm not talking about all black people, just the bad ones. And it's this, this kind of loop that people have gotten trapped into that makes it so problematic, that makes it so hard to discuss. Because if instead of thinking of a racist as the entire being of a person, we could learn to, to critically analyze ourselves, our own ideas, our own thoughts, our own actions, our own words, and really think about, okay, someone said that what I just said was racist, why did they say that? Let's have that conversation. And in today's world, that's really hard to do, but it's exactly what we need to do. We need to start to really analyze these moments of racism as an adjective and see if what we're actually doing is perpetuating this racism, or we can kind of critically internally analyze these things, these ideas, these thoughts that we have ourselves and work on it. Um, for years, I thought I was not a racist person and every once in a while, I'll think something is like, no, that's, that's pretty racist. And I don't mean anything evil by it. It's just something that floated in through my brain. And I have to consciously make myself stop and then think about it and say, why did I have that thought? I don't think I'm a racist, but what I just said was definitely racist. So even people that really, really try not to be racist will have moments of racism. And it's learning to accept that, that it can happen, but then you can improve upon it. And that's how you flip from being racist to being anti-racist. So if you're just really, really analyzing your thought patterns, your processes, um, thinking about your personal experiences and then thinking about other people's perspectives, you can really pinpoint in these little moments of racism to change yourself for the better. And anybody can do it, they just have to put in the work. And it's that part that makes it really, really tough, but it's the important work we have to start doing. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. That finger, by the way, was meant to tell you you had one minute to go, so your timing was perfect. <laughs> Our second uh, presenter this evening is going to be Sergeant First Class Crystal Wilson. Crystal, will you identify yourself? Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sergeant First Class Wilson. Um, I'm actually with um, the Equal Opportunity Office um, out on Fort Drum with 10th Mountain Division. So I'm an uh, equal opportunity advisor. Um, my job, my role is actually to go out and educate um, our soldiers, our troops, DOD civilians about racism, to, to help them recognize uh, when we have problems and, and stuff about uh, racism within the, the units or the organizations. Um, we actually, um, you know, the definition, um, like earlier, is for us is um, what we try to make sure we let our soldiers um, know is racism is the attitude of belief, behaviors, or the institution arrangements. And a lot of times with, us, so with our soldiers coming from, you know, all over the country, all over the world, um, sometimes with, um, with racism, you know, they don't know that that's something that they have been doing or because it's just like, like um, he said, the um, the presenter before me that it's sometimes it's institutionalized. You 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 grew up in that that area or you grew up in that environment. So when you now go out and meet new people or different people, um, you have that um, that mentality. So um, with um, tonight, what I will be discussing um, will be racism in the 
our definition in the military, how we 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 solve it, how do we fix it? We talk to our soldiers. Um, we have training for our soldiers. We try to do quarterly training um, to go out and, and talk to every single soldier, whether it's in basic training when they first arrive in the military. Uh, we address racism. We we address racism when they go to AIT. When they first get here to Fort Drum or any installation, they're normally doing briefs where they, they have that opportunity or me as that equal opportunity advisor, we go out and we give them that training. Okay, hey, you know, welcome to our organization. Welcome to this post. And we talk to them and um, we actually give them a brief on racism, on sexism, but the biggest thing right now that we are facing is racism. So right now in, in the country, we have been doing a lot of um, briefings to make sure that it will not be tolerated in the military, as well as definitely up at Fort Drum. We also, when we're doing these briefings, because a lot of times we don't see family members, we actually encourage family members and DOD civilians. Because DOD civilians, we have the Equal um, Employment Opportunity Office. So we also have it to the DOD civilians here. But for family members, we also offer training for those family members where they are allowed to as well come out and participate in, in the training, in the newcomer brief, so they will understand also what is expected as, of them as the family members to these um, the, the military. I probably use less time, so. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, is that it, Crystal? Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank Three you minutes. very much. Okay, you came in plenty of time. Okay, yeah. our third, our third person, Rebecca Ream. Um, Hi, I'm Rebecca Ream, and uh, I teach sociology at JCC. I've been here a long time, um, almost thirty years now, and uh, I've seen a lot of changes at the college over those thirty years, and. One of the important ones, of course, is we have Ty Stone as president now. Plus, Margaret's made a big difference at getting together programs and at working on diversity and inclusion at the college. And I want to thank Margaret for getting this forum together and being in charge of our Voices for Social Change um, group. And I'd like to start with... Um, a definition of racism from a sociology perspective. I teach sociology. Margaret, if you could put that first slide up, please. Thank you. So first of all, and I'll go as quickly as I can, and you can read along. Racism is, from a sociological perspective, an ideology. It's a set of beliefs and ideas that explains a stratification system. So sexism explains gender stratification. So racism is a set of beliefs and ideas that justifies and explains why one category of people is considered superior while another is defined as inferior. And as sociologists, we always want to emphasize that race is socially constructed. We create those definitions of race in our society as we interact with each other based on those nouns and adjectives that Brian was talking about. And that goes for ethnicity as well. Next slide. Next slide, Margaret. Examples. In Western European and US society, because of our history, non-white peoples are defined as inferior. Another example based on ethnicity, Jews have been historically stigmatized in Western civilization. People can be racist and not even know it. And I think Brian hinted at that. Mm -hmm. We often call this implicit bias. So racism can be both covert, open, and overt, hidden, or unconscious. And Brian was talking about that. He talked about racists, people not believing that they're racist. They're not thinking about the words that they use and the context within which they use those words. Next slide. Examples of overt, open racism, and you can read there. And generally, almost always, overt racism in today's society is socially unacceptable. 
covert racism, however, is hidden. It's, it might not appear to be racist, but it ends up being racist in practice. Discrimination by banks in lending housing loans to African Americans. Racial profiling in the criminal justice system. Denying that there's something like racism in American society and white privilege, which we have an upcoming forum about. A generic fear of non-white people. And Brian mentioned that, and Brian gave an example of that when he talked about being afraid to go in a particular neighborhood. Blaming the big victim, claiming that white people are really the victims of racism. Mass incarceration, and we've all heard a lot about that recently. Anti-immigrant feelings and policies. And generally, and I dare to get into this, but Make America Great Again seems to relate to an idea that America was great in the 1950s, before the Civil Rights Movement. Covert racism is more socially acceptable. It's more insidious though, and maybe harder to overcome. Next slide, Margaret. Next. So I will pose a question to the audience and you can answer later. Think about it though, which is worse? Open racism or hidden overt racism? And I want the audience to think about that and maybe address that question later. Next, Margaret. We often hear the phrase systemic racism. That's been in the news a lot, right? right? We've all heard about systemic racism and Black Lives Matter wants to dismantle systemic racism. But what is it? Next. So sociology also terms this form of ideas, beliefs, and practices based on those ideas and beliefs, institutional racism. I'm saying that institutional racism, institutionalized racism is another um, word, another way of putting systemic racism. And it's institutionalized in that it is built into the way that social institutions in American society function. And I'd like to draw your attention back again to something that Brian said. And, and Brian said he was talking about individual people. He was analyzing things at a micro level. And individual people thinking about what they say, how they say it, the context within which they talk. And that's one way to start to overcome individual bias. But sociology also looks at things at the macro level, the large scale, the entire society. And that's where we look at the problems of systemic or institutionalized racism. Because the ideas and the practices that flow from those ideas are deeply embedded in our culture. It's history, it's language, and its norms and values. Examples. Well, I, I mentioned mass incarceration before. Racial profiling, redlining, and the old Jim Crow laws that existed until the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. Those policies are systemically embedded in the culture. They're deeply embedded in the culture and they stem from ideas and beliefs that are also deeply embedded in the culture. Mass incarceration, for example. If you look at Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, she makes a very good argument that mass incarceration is a form of Jim Crow. Jim Crow laws in the South control the behavior of freed blacks after the Civil War. And they did that, segregation, et cetera, harsher penalties for blacks than whites, arresting blacks for crimes like vagrancy. Jim Crow laws did that in the South after the Civil War until the 1950s and 1960s. 
she says that mass incarceration is a new form of Jim Crow because it controls African Americans, especially young black men, by incarceration. Examples of beliefs. Well, those stereotypes. African Americans are good at sports. Latinos prefer low rider cars. Black is bad, white is good. Blacks riot and are thugs or criminals by their very nature. Those ideas and the stereotypes, some of them listed below, have been built into the culture of American society. It's very difficult. People learn these stereotypes and ideas, like Brian mentioned, like Crystal's talking about. Crystal's talking about trying to train people to recognize these stereotypes and move away from them. And we see that starting to happen today. One of the reasons for these conversations about words is that we've recognized at the college and in our teaching as professors and in our daily lives as citizens that the protests over the summer have made a big difference in how white Americans view the problems of racism in American society. At one point in June of 2020, over 60% of white Americans agreed that Black Lives Matter was a good thing, that it had good ideas, that the criminal justice system needed to be reformed. Now, over time, that some of that, <clears throat> some of that belief has declined. Nevertheless, Black Lives Matter made a big difference. Those protests caused things to start happening sooner than might have otherwise happened. And I'll finish with this. And I want to <clears throat> finish off with a, with a, a quote from a sociologist, Peter Berger. And Peter Berger said, the wisdom of sociology is that things are not what they seem. And I think that kind of echoes what Brian said before. And also, it also echoes what Jerry Wilshelm said at the beginning, that there's more to this than it seems. Racism is a very complex phenomenon in American society. And it's <clears throat> these kind of forums, these kinds of discussions taking place nationwide that are making a difference in how people think about relationships between different categories of people. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. Thank you. Okay, you've heard from our presenters. Now is the time for the panelists to uh, think for half a minute and um, ask some questions of some of the people who've just presented. So identify yourselves and um, uh, Margaret will put you back on the air. Um, I have a question for Crystal. Oh. Hi, Crystal. Okay. Can, can you give me an example of a specific, I don't know, a specific situation that you might consider to be an example of racism in the military? Can, can you repeat that, please? I'm sorry. Can you give me an example? And it could be a hypothetical example. I'm not asking you to name names or anything, but can you give me an example of what would be considered racism in the military. Okay. Um, so we actually um, had a soldier uh, came in and she said her, um, her commander, uh, one of the, her leaders said that um, Mexicans were, were good in the motor pool. Um, so that's why most of them were mechanics. Um, so yeah, that wasn't, it wasn't funny the day she said it. Um, yeah. but that was a situation where, yes, um, yeah. and it happens, we, we've heard it. It's, it's one of the examples 
that we use uh, when we're doing our, our, our training. And, you know, that like, like um, Brian had said earlier, the stereotypes that sometimes uh, soldiers see and think like, okay, oh, well, uh, he would be a, a great mechanic because in my town, um, you know, I think that. So we, we have situations where like that, uh, we have to address the leadership, we address the soldiers, and, and like I said earlier, we, we try to do that training, to say stuff like that is stereotyped, and of course, um, if I was a Mexican, it, it is offensive because I cannot fix cars. Um, I'm, I'm not a, you know, be a, a great car, which I could, um, especially up here, but um, th those are types of situations that um, in our office we sometimes still encounter, and um <clears throat> I always say, even though it's um it's 2020, uh, a lot of people think that racism is something that we're really not experiencing um, or seeing, but we still see it in the military, which uh, makes the need for my job, um, of course. All right. May I also ask you, um, that's a kind of a personal, uh, Not I'm not referring to you, but I mean, if somebody makes a personal crack like that, uh, that uh, Latinos make good mechanics. What about promotions? That's an institutional uh, decision on their part. Um, are there problems with that that you can see or if you would, would talk about? Well, um, I don't necessarily see it because a lot of promotions are based off of, um, you know, we have systems in place. So sure. sometimes uh, we will have a, a soldier feel like they're being discriminated uh, against, or maybe they did not get that promotion. They competed against, um, you know, an African, I'm sorry, Penelope. Uh, they competed against an a African American and, and a Caucasian. We maybe competed against the same thing. Uh, maybe we're both the same at PT, where we both have the same work ethic, um, same everything. And, and a lot of times, or not a lot of times. There are instances where, yes, sometimes we do feel that maybe I did not get that promotion because I'm African American and that person is Caucasian. Um, but I have seen situations where um, they have said the, the same. Where as a uh, African American, or even Mexican, my my boss and my supervisor was. African American, and since I was African American, maybe I got that position. So it is, it, yeah. it does happen in, in both instances where it's not, you know, necessarily where as a minority we're seeing it. But, um, you know, if that's just something that at that time that uh, they, they feel and they come in and, and they have those conversations, a lot of times the best thing that we do to solve it. Is, and the great thing I always say about the military, like I said, I've been in 19 years. The great thing about the military is any situation, Penelope, any situation that you, you have, I'm sorry, that's my cat. Any situation or any experiences that we go through, the great thing is that we can actually go to those leaders and talk okay. to those leaders and say, hey, your soldier in your organization feel like this. Um, and most leaders, most great leaders will go and talk to those soldiers, talk to the unit, sure. talk to, you know, all of them to say, hey, you know, I'm sorry that maybe I gave that perception. And, you know, they fix it. We're, we're able to fix a lot of stuff like right there on the spot. Like, hey, you know, yeah. maybe I have been unfairly um, giving our promotions. And um, like I said, I've always felt that when we talk to them, and, and make them acknowledge, like, hey, sir, hey, ma'am, hey, first sergeant, um, you know, your soldiers feel like this. The great thing that I can always say and that I've noticed in, in my job in this position is that it's on the spot fix. Uh, I acknowledge that. I wasn't aware that maybe that's how I was being. Maybe I was being unfair. Uh, maybe I was not giving promotions. Um, to all the, you know, African Americans, all the Caucasians. So, you know, all of, any females, uh, you know, given to a prim primary demographic, and, you know, they fix it. They fix it. So, what you're saying is that their institution, their institutional um, resources that you can go to yes. to redress these grievances. Yeah. Okay. I think that's, that's what we're lacking yeah. in, in the civil, 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 civil world. Well, we, we, um, we, we try to, like I said, we, we 
we try to do the training um, quarterly um, because, as you can tell by what happened over the summer, uh, with a lot of, um, you know, the attacks and everything and the protesting and everything going on, it still happens. And we still see it in the military. It, it is still happening. Um, when I go home, um, yes, I'm, I'm in the military, but when I take this uniform off and I go home, um, it's happening in my town. So a lot of times, you know, we, we try to make soldiers know, like, okay, being here at Fort Drum or whatever post that you're at, um, you're kind of like um, segregated to that area. So, you know, being here at Fort Drum, you're not really exposed as much to what's happening in your hometown. You're not sure, seeing sure. it. But when you go you. home, uh, you maybe want to participate or, or go um, or, or, okay, well, you know, this mm -hmm. is my family. This is my crew. This is my, and we tell them like, hey, guess what? Um, for that amount of time that you go home, you are still a soldier. Yeah. And, you know, you will still hold yourself to the same accountability that you would hold yourself if you was here at at Fort Drum. Good. i got to cut you now because we have other okay. people. Okay. Gotcha. Is there anyone else uh, who would like to address one of these speakers? We still have some time for that. Actually, if she doesn't mind, I'd like to ask uh, First Sergeant something else. Go ahead. Uh, so, uh, so a little background. So my father was in the Army. Um, he, was a, he was a very racist individual, uh, the, the very stereotypical racist. He would throw around the N-word, never saw anything wrong with it. Um, but he had one buddy um, who was African-American who was like his best, closest, <laughs> most reliable friend. And I know that a lot of times, especially in the military, especially active duty when you're in battle, um, that you kind of form those kind of brotherhoods with people. And I kind of wondered, it's kind of a two-part question, um, do you see people learning to overcome racism through these shared experiences, or do you see them still being kind of racist, even though they shouldn't be because they've had these great experiences mm -hmm. with people of other races and cultures? Okay, hopefully I answer you because... Uh... Maybe hopefully I get both of the questions. So um, yes, I, I actually do see uh, where um, we have soldiers. Uh, I actually had an experience with a soldier a couple of um, uh, months ago, um, and as we was talking, we was going through some training together, and uh, he actually acknowledged because I knew I, I sensed that um, he was perhaps a little bit racist. Uh, he, he was I sensed it and. Um, it was a conversation that we and one of my other um, friends had, uh, you know, the conversation, like, hey, do you know this? And um, I think halfway through the training, it was something that he acknowledged himself that said, you know, I, I guess I didn't really realize that, you know, I was a little bit racist um, or that I had those tendencies because um, I forgot where he was from. I think it was from Missouri. Um, not to, you know, say anything about Missouri, but I remember him saying he was from Missouri and he said his family was really racist but he just didn't realize that he still had those feelings. And he felt that, okay, um, I have workers that I work with that, you know, are black and uh, African-American and I'm good friends with them. And I have them over to my house um, or I go to their house or, you know, we work together. But he still was able to acknowledge that um, after um, some of the training that I still had um, some slight racist tendencies that I needed to, that he needed to work on. Yeah. Um, I don't know. If, I hope that answers you because a little bit, but yeah, he, we, we still see it. it. It's still there. Like we have a lot of ones that say, Hey, my best friend is, um, you know, my best friend is, is black, but that's their only friend. And <laughs> when you see them, they're together all the time, but they will also in the next breath say, when I go home, um, no, I go home and my family, um, doesn't, my family mm. would, would, um, just own me if I was to, to even bring this person home, even say that I talked to this person. Thank you. Could I follow up on what Crystal said? Sure, go. In sociology, there's a theory called contact hypothesis. And the contact hypothesis says that over time, if people are working together on a common goal, to reach a common goal, in relatively equal circumstances, 
For example, everybody has an equal chance at promotion, etc., like Crystal was talking about. Then over time, it starts to diminish prejudice. And it's been um, a theory that's been tested with the military. And as social institutions go in American society, the military, it may still have problems with racism, yes, but as social institutions go in American society, research from the contact hypothesis shows that the military is one of the best social institutions for reducing prejudice. Yes, It has I've to do that. with people working together to reach a common goal. I have a question for you, Becky. Sure. Um, I'm not a, I'm not a um, sociologist, um, but there's a little bit of psychology involved in this business of racism, uh, yeah. but also then the notion that uh, most of our decisions really are subconscious and not necessarily conscious, especially on the affective level. Um, now the question is this, if, if I am raised in, an, in, in a family or a town or, or some part where even before I can make nouns when I'm a child, yeah. I'm absorbing what is going on around me. And part of that is people's reactions to other people. I'm really a vivid observer of, of everything the adults are doing because I want to be one of them too. Yeah. And so the problem is, is that we learn much more uh, than we can actually verbalize when we're children. Right. So when we become verbal, we've already learned a way of responding and then we find the words to say it. And so this issue of being consciously uh, prejudiced or unconsciously prejudiced and allowing it to, to um, uh, affect our behavior. Could you comment on that? Can that sure. be unlearned? Can that be unlearned? You were talking about that a minute ago. Yes, but the research in psychology and sociology both indicates that it's kind of like what Brian was talking about earlier. Everyone has some level of racist ideas in them because we are born and raised in this culture. Right. So we learn from a very young age that white is good, black is bad, etc. Sure. But we can unlearn that. And you've got Brian there as an example. He's raised in a racist household. Yes, Brian? Oh, yeah. But he's not. And I'm an example, too. My parents were very racist. Me, too. But I rejected it. And I rejected it from a very young age because of some particular things that they told me that I just did not believe. It just mm -hmm. didn't make sense. For example, when I was a little girl, I went to a county fair and I wanted to get to see an exhibit. And my grandparents won't let me get near it because there were a bunch of black people standing there. And I said, why? And remember, I'm seven years old, <laughs> Five, seven years old. And my grandmother said, because the dirt will rub off on you. Oh, jeez. Yeah, but I didn't believe her. I didn't believe her because it just didn't make sense. You know, so I yeah. sort of rejected all of that racism in my own family because it didn't make sense to me. And it wasn't nice. Yeah. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions of our presenters? We're a little bit of ahead of ourselves on time. So I'm gonna open it up. Is that okay with you, Margaret? Yes, that would be fine. Okay, let's open it up to anybody now. Uh, do you have any questions of any of our panelists? Um, Oh, yes, we do. We have a few coming in. Okay, shoot. Let me see what we've got here. The first question that's come in is addressed to Brian. How did you start to identify moments where you started to unconsciously think racist thoughts? And for Becky Ream, who will speak secondly, uh, how do we start to identify covert racism? Brian, you speak first, please. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it actually probably started through uh, reading literature, pro probably like uh, Mark Twain, like Huck Finn or Tom Sawyer or something. And uh, having a good enough teacher in like, I think fourth grade or something like that, to kind of like 
really spent time focusing on unpacking um, you know, the gym character and what this kind of does for the people. And, mm-hmm. and then kind of in my own life, probably really soon after that, um, really thinking about things that, um, that my father would say, things that he would do, yeah. and then really kind of putting those two together, like, well, he's kind of acting like these people for Mark Twain, when he should mm-hmm. be acting like these people for Mark Twain. These people never did anything <laughs> to him. And mm-hmm. so it was really like a combination of literature with my own experiences. Um, it's just the right age for me that kind of put the two together. Good. Good. Becky, your question was, how do we start to identify covert? Do they mean covert or overt? Well, it's a good question because sometimes there was confusion in your presentation as to which was which. Okay. Covert is hidden. Right. And overt is is open. So somebody burns a cross on your your lawn, that's definitely racism. And it's overt. It's overt. Mm-hmm. It's overt, open. Yeah. So overt, open. Covert, hidden. Yes. Covert racism is harder to identify. Yes. Covert racism is like, um, well, as Brian was talking about, it's those things that might be inside your own head. It's the things that might be implicit bias that we aren't even aware of, that we have inside our own heads as individuals. But covert, hidden racism, as the examples I used, uh, well, the example of racial profiling. Well, racial profiling in the criminal justice system Mm -hmm. is an example of racism, yes. yes. But it's presented as, well, the police have to have these identifying characteristics to look for criminals. The problem is those identifying characteristics are often based on stereotypes about young black men generically being criminals. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Does that help? Yes, it's covert is like an absorbed um well it's all learned. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, other questions? Yes, there is one. It's pretty long, so it's a two-part question. So if you don't mind, I'm gonna read it out and paraphrase. So basically the question is relating to, how do you know when you're being offensive? And this is relating to emulating style or fashion of various cultures. So for example, a person can have a dream catcher hanging in their home, but they are not Native American. And another example would be like um, the singer Adele, who was um, blasted for wearing a Bantu knots in her hair. Mm -hmm. Um, Examples like that, um, the use of culture for fashion. Are there any comments from the panelists? That's uh, um, the term for that in sociology is cultural appropriation. It's when one culture appropriates, takes, um, something from another culture and turns it, like you said, into a fashion accessory, for example. Or an example of cultural appropriation is names, the names of sports teams, the Atlanta Braves, right. the Redskins, and the use of Native American imagery by those sports teams the Chiefs. that perpetuates stereotypes about Native Americans. It's called cultural appropriation. What is the the purpose? Okay, pardon. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Becky. What is the purpose of cultural appropriation? Well, it might be just like the example from the questioner. Um, It's a fashion statement, or the use of the dream catcher. It it just becomes a fad or a fashion in popular culture. Is there is no particular purpose other than whatever the purpose is in popular culture? Sometimes it's the purpose is to sell clothing, for example, or to appear to be culturally aware when actually the person is inappropriately stealing some aspect of the culture that they don't really understand. That's good, that's good. 
What I hear you saying is what the offense is, however, is that the appropriation actually minimizes uh, the culture that it's appropriating from. It and that's the offense. And, that's the it offense. It demeans and stereotypes it means something that may have deep meaning in one culture. And yet when the other culture takes that as a symbol of fashion or a popular fad, right. it lessens it. It makes it, you know, seem like it's not what it is. It commercializes it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, it is now seven o'clock. Uh, we have a full hour where anyone can ask any questions of anybody, <laughs> which is a very broad uh, opening to those of you who have been very patient and, and very silent. Obviously, you're here for a reason. You're trying to learn something or you're trying to find out where do you fit into this whole picture? We would really appreciate your comments. We would really like to open up a conversation here of the people we live with, and that's this community. So if you have something on your mind, um, let us know, would you please? Um, I have a question here. Can someone discuss microaggression and how that exhibits itself and its connection to racism. Microaggression, please define that term. What does that mean? My go with it, Brian? What is microaggression? Uh, so a microaggression is really just um, these very, very subtle things that people do. Um, and it's, it's, it's really never voluntary. It's just this learned kind of patterned response. Mm -hmm. um, a, a really good classic example is if you're, a, uh, if you're a white woman walking down the street and you see a black guy walking towards you, your microaggression reaction is to clench your purse tighter to your body. <laughs> and you yeah. might not even realize you're doing it, but you just yeah. do this out of a naturally learned behavior okay. that something in your body tells you to be afraid of this person. And it's those things like that. Okay, thank you. Now the question is, um, how could you approach a conversation with someone about their racist tendencies without seeming, oh, is that, that's the wrong one. That was the other one, discuss microaggression and how that exhibits itself. I think you answered that question. Okay, let me get to the next question. It's again to you, Brian. How could you approach a conversation with someone about their racist tendencies without seeming like you're attacking them? Yeah. Well, you can't do it on social media. <laughs> no. It does not work no. on social media. No, no you um, can't. It, has, it has to be a face-to-face -face conversation, and it has to, it really does, and that's the hard part. It has to be with someone that you already trust as a human being. Ah. So it can't just be, you know, me walking up to a student the first week of class. It can't be me walking down the street to my neighbor and saying, hi, neighbor, blah, 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 if I don't really have a relationship with them yet. Um, because it is that, that learned response, that your first reaction is to deny that you're being racist in any way. Mm -hmm. so, so the person has to be very trusted already. It has to be a fairly decent relationship already. But then both parties have to be willing to really listen to each other. Like if I go to talk to someone about them being racist, I can't just stand there and go like, you know, you're being racist and you need to stop it. And this is why you're being racist. They're never going to listen, never going to listen to that. So yeah. it has to be a very civil conversation and you have to also listen to their perspectives. They might try to convince you why what they said or why what they did isn't racist and you have to let them talk. And that's really hard to do sometimes, you know? But if you really wanna have that good conversation where we can move forward, you have to have those kinds of bonds and those kinds of relationships in order to have those kinds of conversations. That's why it's not easy. I mean, I wish I had an easy answer. I, I'd give it to everybody. No, this is not an easy thing to answer. Um, does anyone else have a comment about that? Have you had that experience? of listening to a good friend who all of a sudden comes out with some language that just says, wait a minute, what is he or she saying? And how do you address that? Um, I've, I've, I've 
I've actually it's um sorry, well, sorry. I've actually had that experience where yes, I, I did have a, a good friend and they um they they maybe was having uh they didn't say it to me, but someone had told me that they were saying you know, they were saying inappropriate stuff. Um and they were Caucasian. Um they had a lot of um black friends, so they felt um that it was appropriate um uh, for them to, to say what they were saying and, and, and speak that way. And I think um, uh, someone it did ask me to speak to them. And like Brian said, you can't do it on online, which is right now everything, a lot of people are talking online. But we was able to have that conversation face-to-face and, and talk about it. And um, they did, um, after the conversation, realize, yes, it is inappropriate. Yes, I do have a lot of um, African-American um, friends, uh, but not only was um the african american friends kind of offensive oops we lost you lost you sorry, sorry about that sorry it's okay um, they, were, they were offended um as well but like i said i think once once you know you have that that civil conversation and they're mature enough and you're mature enough and know how to um talk to them appropriately uh it, it's normally they uh they adjusted to it and, and they fixed themselves. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm sorry for the interruption with the phone. Um, anyone else want to comment on that? A personal experience of suddenly realizing that uh, someone you are fond of, someone who you are uh, close to, uh, is suddenly expressing him or herself uh, in a very racist way. Maybe they're not aware of it. What do you do about that? Do you just shrug it off? Or if you're friendly enough with them, say, hey, why are you talking that way? What's on your mind? Anybody else want to say something to that? Well, I hate to keep talking, but I will. <laughs> Go. So, so especially when it's because because the work is so important, and it is work. Yes, um, it is. You keep saying conversation or discussion, um, but it's work. Um, there could be people that came in tonight just to hear what all this was about. That's a great first step. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying someone came in here just because they think they're racist, but if you're here listening to all these people talking, it's because you're interested in being a part of the conversation. And then the hard part is taking that next step of, okay, how do I do the work to do this? Um, there's, a, there's a great book by, uh, I'm blanking on his name, uh, Ibram X. Kendi. Um, and he talks about how everyone is, everyone is either a racist or an anti-racist, but there's nothing in between. There's no such thing as passive anti-racism. <laughs> it's hard because it's kind of true. If you're not doing something, and I'm not saying you have to go out and be the strongest, most vocal social justice warrior on the planet, <laughs> but if, you, if you're willing to address these weird, very uncomfortable situations um, and do it in, in a respectful manner, you're fighting racism. You're cracking open that door, maybe just a little bit, but maybe for some people, all they need is that little bitty crack in the window to then really start to internalize and think about it some more on themselves. Maybe they'll come back two weeks later and say, hey, a couple of weeks ago, you said this, yeah. and, and I was really mad that you said that, but I <laughs> thought about it, and I want to talk some more about it. It's rare, but it happens. And the more people actually confront those types of things, um, again, in a positive manner, um, with, with that change in mind, we can help people, sometimes one by one, sometimes as a group, um, and you never really know the impact that, that has. Um, and we talk about, you know, like even as kids, you do good things because you're supposed to do good things. You don't do it because somebody is watching. And with being an anti-racist, it's the same thing. You never really know the impact that your actions will have if you're actively being an anti-racist. Just as on the other side, if you're being a racist, you never really know the impact that's gonna have either. Maybe some parents don't realize they're raising racist kids by doing racist things. They don't want to do that. It wasn't part of their lesson plan for parenthood, but it happens. So again, being aware of your actions and always thinking about, could I do something or say something that might help improve the situation? And if you feel like you can't do it or say it safely, then yeah, don't do it. Don't take those kinds of chances, you know? Um, but take the ones you can. Get a win when you can get a win. And you can kind of start those conversations. And it's, a re it's really the only way from a personal level to kind of start to do those types of things. Let me piggyback on that and just say that there's a, uh, an old African proverb that says, 
talking together is loving one another. And I always like that proverb. Okay. Okay, um, I see part of this one. I can only see the tail end of this. Um, one. Where would you suggest people with racist families look for positive role models? Great question. Um, well, what do they mean by positive role models outside the family? I don't know. It might be an aunt or an uncle or Could be. That's somebody next to, I don't care. But it's not the immediate nuclear family. Okay. Well, college is good to look for your professors as role models of how to be an anti-racist. If they're anti-racist. Get like Brian said, you could get a number of books and the author of that book, it's titled How to Be an Anti-Racist. His name is Ibrahim Zendi, and it's spelled X-E-N-D-I. X-E-N-D-I. And you could go on Amazon and order his book or any number of books that are out now about how to be an anti-racist. And look for role models in the public sphere like that. Thank you. Um, one of the things that um, I encourage Crystal, uh, Crystal. Um, oh, okay. Go, Crystal. Okay. So one of the things that um, I encourage um, soldiers to do, um, and we do it through training, is um, we encourage them to, to sit next to somebody different, to talk to somebody different uh, from from you. Sit, sit, um, so... Um, I was a, a drill sergeant in basic training. Uh, we got soldiers brand new, um, coming straight from living uh, with their parents from their hometown where sometimes they had never seen another black person. Sometimes they had never seen um, another white person, de depending on, who, on where they was from. And um, one of the things that we always encourage, and, and even now, is um, talk to someone different. You're not going to go um, have a, a group of, you know, all black, all white. So we encourage, you know, because of course, when you, when you go, it's easy to go when you go to college, uh, you, you try to associate or sit next to somebody that you're used to your norm. Uh, but one of the things that we encourage is sit next to somebody different, talk to somebody different. If you're trying, if you're trying to be um, from a, anti-racist home and you know how do you fix it and yes go to college but if you go to college and you go sit next to somebody or only socialize with someone who looks like um who's at home then you really just came and, and didn't do anything because now okay so i only so i came from you know from the bronx with my family only new black people go to college because i want to change i want to meet different people i want to experience different cultures but when I go to college, um, maybe I'm only sitting with um, the people that look like this at my house. Uh, even though I'm in a diverse college, I'm, I'm here in Jefferson Community College or I'm, I'm in um, NYU. So it would be easy enough for me, yes, to just sit with, you know, everyone that looks like me, but it would be harder um, and make, make it harder on myself to learn other cultures to just say, hey, my name is Crystal. Um, I want to meet other people. I want to learn different cultures. I don't want to just um, go because, you know, of course, that's what we do. We're, we're used to, we like to go and be with familiar surroundings. We want to be with familiar surroundings. You want to learn. Yes. Yes. Okay, here's another question. It's for you, Crystal. <laughs> Uh, are there repercussions for service members who participate in racist actions? Yeah. That might be a repeat, yeah. but uh, give a I quick answer to that one. Yeah, yes, it is. Uh, like I said, we, we do training. If we notice that this soldier is, is repeatedly still going through the same thing, uh, we're having the conversations, they're still maybe attending those same 
um, inappropriate meetings, having those, um, making those same inappropriate statements. Um, yes, the repercussions is you have to go home. Failure to adapt. You, you perhaps did not adapt to your new surroundings. Um, you feel that any other race that is different from yours is, is wrong. Um, and you've said it on multiple occasions. The first time we try to do training, the second time, um, you know, they, they have to go other routes. Okay, thank you. So there are repercussions. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I have, a, I have a question for Crystal. Crystal, how much hate group activity have you seen at Fort Drum? Realistically, how much white supremacist hate group membership might be occurring? So I actually haven't seen any. Um, okay, good. I, I haven't good. had anyone come in, so I haven't seen any. That's good. Here's a tough one. Uh, it's a question. I'll, I'll open this to anyone. How do you address issues of race and racism with your family, friends, and colleagues? How do you do it? Well, those are all very different groups of people. So, I mean, I think, I think each Intimate. one can handle a little differently. Uh, and let's call them intimacies. Uh, in, in, in the broadest sense, somebody you know, somebody you've lived with for years, somebody that's been a friend for years, a colleague that you really like and have known for years. How do you open a conversation about that when you realize that they are racist? Is it that they're racist? Or is it they may have, might have had some implicit bias slip out that you've become aware of? No, the question is, Covert racism. Covert is hidden, so that's implicit. Oh, okay. Covert. Thank you. Thank you for your correction. So, if if you if you have somebody who's really close to you, and you realize that there's stuff slipping out of their mouths or their thoughts or their actions or their reactions to other people, and you realize those are racist reactions, how do you open a conversation with that person about that? Well, you just have to start it. It's, uh, I mean, especially if it is someone that's close to you. Um, that's what I was kind of alluding to earlier, where right, you, were. you have to, you have to take that step. You have to be the braver person um, and say, like, "Hey, you said X, Y, and Z, and that's not okay. I'm not okay with it. I'm sure other people aren't okay with it. Um, do you want to talk about why it's not okay to say that, or why it's not okay to do that? Um, and if you're close with them. You know, I mean, I wouldn't say so formally like a business email like that, um, but you have to approach them about it. You have to see if they're willing to discuss it um, to kind of see if that's the first step or not. What if they tell you to step off a cliff? I mean, that's that's the first step. And if it's if it's something that only you heard and it's only going to influence you, um, it depends again on the situation. If it was a colleague, um, I would probably talk to their supervisor and say, just a heads up. Um, you know, so-and-so said, said this, and I want you to be aware that this could become a problem in the future if, if this keeps happening. Yeah, yeah. If, if it's like, you know, a close friend or a family member, um, you, you have a little bit more freedom to kind of keep going after it. Yeah. yeah. Now, there's going to be a point where they're either going to actually have a conversation with you or they're going to tell you to shut up and never bring it up again. Mm -hmm. And then depending on what you want to do relationship-wise, then you make your choices then. Right. But you have to kind of open it up initially with that understanding um, and expressing to them that that wasn't okay. Uh, because a lot of it, and uh, um, uh, Becky covered a lot of this, about that learned behavior, um, that these are things that are ingrained in them. And especially with people that have always had kind of that, that very covert biases where just every once in a while something kind of racist will slip out, whether an action or thought or word or something like that. Um, they might think that that's perfectly acceptable because no one has ever told them it's not because they grew up in that environment. And so if it's someone that they actually trust, they actually have a, a relationship with and they tell them that's not okay, that's kind of racist. Um, it might be the first time anyone has ever said that to them. Yeah. So you also have to be kind of ready to kind of give them a second to breathe on that because they might not understand that it's racist. So it's, it's again, it's that work of understanding when to push harder and when to pull back. Um, but you can do so a lot more with people that you actually know, people that you trust, um, loved ones especially. But it can also be really, really hard. So it's again, it's that putting in the work, but then realizes when you might have to cut your losses. 
I have a personal question to ask. When I was a little kid, I was in the Cub Scouts. And one of the things we did is we put on a minstrel show. Oh. Now, I'm an, old, I'm an old geezer, okay? But we all, when I was a little kid, we all went into blackface. Oh, no. tried, tried to be what we thought to be oh, no. black entertainers. You know, we didn't think anything of it. Now, suppose somebody offers that to you now. What oh, would you God. do? <laughs> what? I mean, besides getting all whizzed out, how would you approach the Cub Scouts of America about that kind of activity? Well, you'd have to go to the Cub Scout leader. Yeah. And explain to them that that blackface is extremely racist. Yes, it is. Examples of people in public, in the public view, who have been caught at doing that and the sanctions that have arose, arisen against those people and how embarrassing it is for politicians to have been caught having done something like that. Sure. And it can ruin your career if you explain to the Cub Scout leader how racist that is. And you don't have to give them a history lesson, but you can call Josh and he'll tell you how racist the minstrel shows Sure. were and are and perpetuating stereotypes about African-Americans. Oh, yes. I haven't seen a minstrel show in, in 40, 50 years. But the point is, when I was a little kid, mm -hmm. they were quite common. Um, okay. I mean, people made great fortunes out of that. Al Jolson is a good example. But I think that we... Okay, I'll, I'll stop there. No, that's actually a great example to bring up. Uh, because that 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 is that was so common in American history. Yeah. Um. That it, it's it's really. I mean, it's. I would like it when when any person or a student would ask, like, well, why why is this racist? Why is this bad? All we're doing is we're dressing up like black people and we're performing songs. We're trying to make people laugh. We're trying to make people happy. How is that possibly racist? Yeah. And that's that's the kind of racism that's harder to kind of get into. It's not that overt racism that uh, Becky was talking about, like burning crosses in someone's yard. Sure. It's things that they seem like they're done for a lighthearted mood. How could this possibly be racist? And burning and, a crush, it's not lighthearted. It, it, <laughs> but it, I mean, it's tough, again, without teaching them the entire history of these things and right. why they did them and the treatment of African-American people throughout history. It's a lot to unpack. So something like that is a really good example of why people struggle with something that they don't think is racist. Yeah. So that's a really good example, actually. Yeah. I can give you um, a film. There's a film, it's by an African-American producer called Marlon Riggs. And the name of it is Ethnic Notions. Ethnic Notions. Mm. And it's available, I'm pretty sure it's available on YouTube now. It's been around for a long time. And he goes through the history of things like the minstrel shows and uh, the, the, the mammy and the sambo and those stereotypes about African-Americans and how they developed in history. So if someone wanted to do a minstrel show, I would show them that film. And is that the problem with Aunt Jemima? Yes. Yeah. It's based on the mammy stereotype. Yes. There's a lot of it on our grocery shelves. There's a lot of it hidden away in some of our entertainment work. Um, but it's there. Okay, let's see what other questions are coming up. Um, Margaret, would you go back to the previous question? This is all I can see is the tail end of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, some of it must have got cut off. So basically the question is that so far we've spoken about various forms of racism that are common among conservative whites, but haven't spoken much about forms of racism that are common among liberal whites. So for example, what is the example? Let me read through it real quick. For example, in this person's experience, liberals are much more likely to be paternalistic, uh, which means the system, principle, or practice of managing or governing individuals. 
business, nations, and so on. So, for example, I would suggest that casting all Black people, Latinx people, as victims, um, just as destructive as casting them as thugs or, uh, or other negative stereotypes. So, in short, what kinds of racism do the panelists see among liberals? And how do you, how do they identify uh, or covert racism in themselves. So this is speaking in regards to liberals. Well, I think that that, that question has at least two different, uh, two different questions built into it. So mm -hmm. it's hard to separate them. I see one of it asking about paternalism. And yes, that's a problem treating people in a paternalistic way is a problem. I don't think that all liberals do that any more than saying that all conservatives are racist because you're stereotyping conservatives and liberals both when you do that, right? And as a quote unquote liberal, I don't think that African-Americans and Latinx people are victims Yes, they have been victims historically, but in today's world, they are also agents of their own social change. So I don't think that they're all victims of historical racism. Yes, people are as a category victimized by things that exist in this society that result in people being treated differently, but African-American and Latinx peoples today are taking control and working towards social changes. And they've been doing that effectively since the original civil rights movement. And they're doing it effectively now with Black Lives Matter, which has been called the second civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Becky. Anyone else wish to comment on that particular issue? Okay, let's move to another. Um, are we seeing any change in covert or overt racism in the different generations? Is there a generational difference? Oh, yeah. Okay. I'd yeah. like, like some of you uh, to comment on that. Well, as a sociologist, is yeah, yeah, yeah. Go it, ahead. It's, it's a big difference, yes, um, and that's going into well, well, now the people who are college aged now, traditional college age people now, um, eighteen to twenty four, twenty five, twenty six, they're called Generation Z, and Generation Z is much more diverse in its um, population than prior generations, plus it's much more likely to recognize the problems of historical racism in American society than prior generations were. Young Why? people are making changes. They're, they're, they have that agency that I was talking about and they are contributing to making many of these changes. I hear you and I agree with you, but why? Why is this generation different? It's born in different historical circumstances. Hmm. It's grown up in a, in a society in which those changes have begun. Mm -hmm. It's grown up in a society now that can have conversations like this. This wouldn't have happened 20 years ago, 25 years ago, what you're doing right now. That's true. It would have happened 25 years ago. Okay. Another question. This one's for you, Brian. How do you react when your father, when he is being racist around you? How do you re react to your father when he's being racist around you? Well, I don't have to do it anymore because he's not with us anymore. Um, when I was younger, I wouldn't confront him. 
Um, I felt that he was like, you know, he's my dad, <laughs> even though I disagree with him, um, I'm just gonna let him do his own thing. And it wasn't until I was older, um, probably 19 or 20, uh, was the first time I actually confronted him on something he said. And, uh, and the more that I did it, I found that he would tend to not do it as often. Now, I don't know if that meant that he had thought about it and he decided that he probably shouldn't say those things anymore, or if he just learned to just kind of shut up and not say those things anymore, yeah. um, just to avoid the conversation. Um, yeah. So I really don't know. Um, but I mean, again, in hindsight, and it is, it's one of those things that as you grow older, as you mature as a person, um, you can kind of find that kind of reserve within you where you feel like you do have the power or the authority to have these conversations simply because you have a belief as well. And I'm not gonna let anybody have an opinion expressed towards me that I disagree with without some kind of rebuttal to it. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's, a, it's a growth thing, it's a maturity thing, um, and it's tough. I mean, I know a lot of people, a lot of my friends, um, if their parents said or did something racist and they told them that was bad or that was wrong, or, they didn't, or at the very least, they didn't react the way they were supposed to, they'd get smacked right across the face. And so I understand really quickly, like, well, you know, you don't go that far too soon, you know? <laughs> so, so I get it, you know? Yeah. Let me ask you personally, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to. Are you on good terms with your father now? Oh, he passed away some years ago. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry I asked that. Oh, that's okay. I was wondering how long that... Um, that rebellion lasted. Well, you're, sorry, bad question. Your rebellion has lasted the rest of your life. <laughs> but the point <laughs> is, how long did it affect your relationship with your father when you became older? Well, with him, and actually, I'm glad you kind of brought that up as a secondary question. Like, so my dad wasn't a overt racist um, in most things in his life. Um, he, he did have black friends. Um, he's kind of funny. He's actually half Japanese. Mm -hmm. um, his mother, who was full Japanese, was probably the most racist person in my family. Mm -hmm. She only liked white people. You know, she was so glad that when her son married a white girl and, you know, um, <laughs> it was always a weird thing growing up. Like, how can you be racist when you're like half Japanese? It never made sense to me, you know? Yeah. Um, but he was, he was also like what I talked about at the very beginning, that he wasn't a bad, evil person. He didn't go around, you know, lynching people <laughs> or burning crosses. Like he would just say these little things to take little stabs at people, um, kind of in order to either make himself feel better or to take them down a peg. Um, sometimes, very rarely, he would say it to their face, but it was always that kind of behind closed doors, that very covert kind of racism mm -hmm. that really only most of the family and close friends knew about. Um, so even though when I started to kind of like counteract things that he would say or do, um, it wasn't like relationship destroying. It was never like I had to like run away from home for 10 years or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's, that, that was my situation. And some people have similar ones. Um, and some people might have to run away from home or, you know, maybe move away and go to college somewhere else and get four years of different experience. That can change a person a lot, you know? So, I mean, you, you can't always have those conversations, but you can always do something about it. Thank you. And thank you for allowing us to be a little bit personal with you. Oh, no problem. Okay. Here's a question. What do you think is the greatest challenge facing the country when trying to overcome racism? How can we overcome this challenge? What is the greatest challenge we have as a nation in overcoming racism? I think actually the, uh, one of the previous questions kind of brought that up, um, that we talked about liberals versus conservatives. Mm -hmm. um, there is nothing that anybody has said today that would indicate that a liberal can't be a racist. There's plenty of liberal racists out there. There's plenty of completely anti-racist conservatives. Um, so I think um, as a country, especially in an election year, regardless of who you're voting for or who you want to vote for, um, it's those conversations that really impact people on a personal level. Um, it's understanding that you can be on one side of the spectrum and your friend can be on the other side, and you can still agree on a lot of things. You might have slightly different principles, you might believe in different things, but it's having these conversations um, that will really bring everyone together. And it's not gonna work all the time, but the more that people have them, the more we'll really recognize that our differences might not be as big as we think that they are. Again, let me put faculty on the, on the spot. Suppose somebody 
comes up with a racist crack in your classroom, what do you do? That's you, you, you try to steer them away from that in the classroom and then speak to them outside of the classroom. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I like that answer. Okay, question. Are we experiencing increased institutional racism because of our political leadership uh, during this election season? Let me add it to put it another way. Do we think our political leaders are influencing how this country is reacting to some of these issues uh, which have long been entrenched uh, in our nation? Well, I think that political leadership has a choice to either increase the polarization in the country or to try to decrease that polarization with things that Brian was talking about, for example. And I also think that political leadership serves as role models for a lot of people, especially for people that are devoted followers of particular political leaders. And if those political leaders endorse white supremacy or refuse to condemn white supremacy, then they're playing to certain members of their political base who hold those white supremacist views. And that can only make things worse. It increases the polarization and it increases the chances for violence. Anybody else wish to comment on that? Thank you. Another question. Um, is there a difference between appropriation and admiration? Mm -hmm. Now, are those technical terms? That's okay. For example, appropriating. Yeah, I mean, it's a thin line, and you can cross it when you're engaging in demeaning stereotypes. Or you can like the minstrel like show. of the culture as well. Yeah, yeah. So, for example, going back a couple of questions, a minstrel show could be both. No. No? Why not? No. The minstrel show is absolutely racist. That is not a form of cultural appropriation because it's not appropriating something from black culture. That is appropriating something that has been a part of white culture, not black culture historically. And it's been a racist part of white culture, and it's the way that it views black culture. It's not really, the minstrel show is not cultural appropriation. Okay. Brian, we're back to you. I get, you're a very popular guy. When you first began, this is Brian, when you first began to discuss these topics with your students, how did you do it in a way, in a safe way, both for yourself and your students? Did you make mistakes? And if so, can you provide an example? I admit that I very much want to bring these conversations into my course, but I am afraid I'll do it wrong. Uh, it is tough. It is not an easy thing to do. Um, so, so when I started doing it, I spent an entire class lecture, first of all, um, as really kind of a, as, as a seminar um, where I said like, these are the things we're going to be reading about. These are some of the topics that are gonna to be generated from these things that we're reading. Um, and we all have to understand as a group that we're gonna discuss these terms. We're gonna discuss race. We're gonna discuss um, prison system. We're gonna talk about police or any of these different ones at different times. And that at no time was, was I insulting any specific group or was anybody else in class to do so as well? So if we talk about stereotypes, we spend a lot of time talking about stereotypes, defining stereotypes. Um, so really getting a good basis of understanding amongst all of us. So when we move forward with the discussion, we all realize we're coming from a place um, out of growth, that we're all doing this because we want to learn more. 
Um, and I'm also very honest with my students um, and I'm, I'm very personal with them as well. Um, so I let them know like some of my history. I, I, I'm very clear um, and I've told a lot of them that you know, I have had very racist ideas. Um, when I was younger, I did racist things. Um, I'm not this pure, innocent person that has never had a racist thought his entire life. And I think that honesty in a classroom um, really helps fuel those conversations. Um, I'm sure I've made mistakes. I mean, I'd be lying if I didn't think I did. Um, I can't pinpoint a very specific one, um, but I'm sure they were there. I'm positive it was there. Because um, anytime you're talking about something that's so important and can have so many reactions, um, you're not going to be perfect. You're just not going to be. I don't know if I answered all the questions there. Pretty much. Thank you, Brian. Anyone else have a comment on that? Uh, here's one, a very simple question. How do you ap appropriately respond to a racist comment? I need to ask a question, maybe have it clarified. If the racist comment is against you, or did you mean a racist comment to you about somebody else? Which are you? Well, let's take both of them. Anyone want to comment? To that? How do you respond to that? To a racist comment to about you or to you? If, if somebody is talking to you, we have two choices on how to interpret this question. Okay. Um, okay. Maybe somebody makes a, a racist crack in your presence and it refers to you. Or so somebody makes a comment to you about a third person or somebody over there on the other side of the field. Taking, I, I th how do you respond to them? I think with um, either way, whether someone to, was to make a racist com comment about me, at me, they say it to me, um, I would address that person. Uh, I would, um, you know, we try not to do the whole yelling and, and you know, we get into like a shout in mouth shouting match, but um. Normally, I think the conversation, and yes, we, we have a lot of conversation in the military. Uh, we, we address um, the situation, let them know, hey, that's not uh, what you said was not appropriate. And as well as if I was to hear a, um, say, the same uh, inappropriate comment or racist comment about someone else, I would also say the same thing. Hey, you know what you said was wrong. Um, I would address it. I would tell them um, why they was wrong. And, you know, it would probably be that that hard conversation or it would be a necessary conversation in order for us to to be able to continue to work together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that the, the thing with the military, um, uh, a lot of the reasons we, we try to do the training and stuff that we do is um, to make it so that um, we can work together. We all have like a, a end goal. And um, if, you know, I can't work work with you because I don't because I know either you don't respect me or I don't respect you because of your values. Then we really it's it's hard to work with someone like that. So it's it's easier for us, I think, to have that conversation to try to to build on that teamwork and saying, hey, what you said is is wrong about this person or about me. Sometimes people will make racist comments to bond with the person that they're talking to at the expense of a third person. Um, what do you do about that bonding? What? Um, so if, if they're trying to bond with someone, um, like they, I guess they think, okay, well, I'm going to say this because you say it. Um, <laughs> Maybe that's what it is. You said it, so I want to now be your friend. And when you said it, it was inappropriate, right? Uh, but you have to make them understand. And, and and that's also where you also have that conversation like, yeah, I said it, but it was inappropriate when I said it as well. A lot of times when we have, when we say some of the stuff we said, because when I was a younger junior soldier, um, I made a comment and I, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't know, you know, I heard all my friends saying, that. I had all my, you know, all my people in my same work area said it. 
And they're like, hey, you know, uh, what you said, you shouldn't be saying it. So, well, he said it. So, you know, I thought everyone was saying it. He said, well, no, that's just what, you know, people in his culture say. Uh, so I was like, well, then how is it wrong for me? And then that's one of the things that we're going through right now where we say, well, she, him, she said it, that person said it. So why can't we say it? Um, it's one of those hard rules that it's inappropriate when we all say it. If it's an inappropriate comment, regardless of who said it, it's it's still inappropriate. Thank you. And it's still inappropriate. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay, let's see what else is on there. Okay. I guess uh, for this might be from a military person. That's for you, um, Crystal. For SFC Wilson being an EEO trainer, do you find that Fort Drum has more or less racism than any other military base? Example, Southern bases. Uh, well, I've only been an a equal opportunity advisor um, at Fort Drum, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I have been to this. I've, I've actually been in the South most of my career, Fort Jackson, um, South Carolina, Fort Bragg, mm -hmm. North Carolina. And um, I, I personal experience, um, like I said, I don't know the statistics based off. I know based off of here at Fort Drum, New York. I haven't seen, um, I didn't see as much racism um, in North Carolina, in the South, when I first got there. Uh, coming from New York, I didn't see it. Um, moving up here, um, being a Southerner, uh, even though I'm from New York City, uh, I lived in um, North Carolina uh, for 20-something years, so now I'm actually a Southerner. So I really haven't seen it um, um, too drastically in either place, so I, I really can't can't answer that question. Uh, I know a lot of people think because of the South, uh, we associate the South with racism, um, but that has not been my experience um, at some of those Southern um, okay. folks and bases. In other words, you don't see a standout difference? No, not really, sir. Thank you. Okay. Question. I don't know who it's addressed to, so it's wide open. To any who care to respond, how do we as an American culture walk the fine line of allowing freedom to protest, but still protect innocent civilians and keep the protest or riots from getting out of control? There's a million dollar question for you. Well, I, I could point out that 96 percent of the Black Lives Matter demonstrations over the summer were peaceful, 96 percent. Where did you get that statistic? I got that statistics from, well, from the New York Times and research that's been done on it, the Pew okay. Research Center, the Pew Research Center, for example. Thank you. 96 percent peaceful. So the media tends to focus on the violence because that gets people to watch television or to go to social media sites. 96% of those demonstrations were peaceful. Thank you. Question? Um... Our culture often jokes around about racism, i.e. Family Guy, South Park, etc. In turn, a lot of people often make similar jokes. How can someone confront such humor, in quotes, when they are confronted with it? I think that's a question for Brian to identify the difference between satire and misuse of language. <clears throat> it, it is tough, I mean, because it does raise that question of like, you know, well, why is it okay if they do that on, you know, on Family Guy or South Park, but if I said it, I'm a racist. Yeah. Um, and it is, it's, it's tough, because, um, I mean, I love comedy, love it. Um, and, I mean, some of my favorite skits are like Dave Chappelle making fun of white people, you know? Um, and 
I don't think I have the answer. Um, and I think there's lots of different answers, but in terms of things that are humorous, um, purely for the sake of humor, especially for humor for the masses, like comedy shows, cartoons, things like that. Um, it's, it's almost, you have to look at it knowing, like Becky said, that this is a satire, that they're making fun of not people, they're making fun of the ideas that other people have of these people. And it, it, it is, that's a really fine line. And I completely understand if someone watches something like that and is offended by it. I mean, that you, 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 it is totally within your right to be offended by something like that. Um, but it's really hard to then say, because that offends me, you don't get to watch it. Because then we're trading on free speech and all kinds of things. It, it's complicated. It really is. It's not an easy solution. Can you just shrug it off or allow it to continue uh, with your family, children? Yeah. Oh, when it's like personal things like that, that's different. I'm talking about like media stuff like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, when it's family, that's different. That's when you can say like, you know, hey, I'm not cool with that. Or that wasn't yeah, would, okay. yeah. would you turn the TV off? Yeah, I mean, if you have a voice in that and it's something you don't want to be a part of, yeah, you could ask them to turn it off, change the channel. Um, okay. if, if they say no, you know, you can walk out of the room and you didn't fix the problem, but you're no longer confronted with it, I guess. But you've made a quiet, a quiet rejection. Yes, you voiced okay. dissent to something that was offensive, yes. Thank you. Okay, we still have time. Uh, question, not addressed to any person. Um, tried to teach about slavery with demonstrating a slave auction. These were relatively young children, so I'm guessing that the teacher was looking for an activity to demonstrate how this felt to be on the uh, receiving end of an auction. What is a more acceptable way to demonstrate this part of our history? Show 12 Years a Slave. You know, show a movie, show 12 Years a Slave. Yeah, there's a lot of learned experiences that are good for learning and they're good for education. And then there's ones like that that are not good. You never want to force someone to have the experience of a slave auction. That's not how you teach about slavery. Mm -hmm. Mm. Anyone else want to comment on that? Thank you, folks. So, anyone else want to say a parting word? Well, then I will. Okay. Thank you, everyone. You've done a great job. You've opened your hearts to us. And um, those of you who uh, didn't speak, um, I'm hoping there will be an opportunity when the college opens again that we can have an open discussion about some of these issues. This is just the first of what I hope will be a continuing conversation that gets more and more and more uh, engaged and involved with our community. So thank you very, very much. And I uh, hope to see you again.